Please stand as you are able for the call to worship. Gather together to worship God. We gather to reunite with God's purposes. Gather together to walk with Christ. We gather to make our way to the cross. Gather together as disciples committed to holy life. We gather to live the faith fully in our lives. Our hymn, God, When Human Bonds Are Broken, it's hymn 603. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Bend your ear to our prayers, Lord Christ, and come among us. By your gracious life and death for us, bring light into the darkness of our hearts and anoint us with your spirit, for you live and reign with the Holy Father and the Holy Spirit one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. This evening's reading is from the 16th chapter of 1 Samuel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he'll kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do and you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peaceably? He said, peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, 
Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. The Lord be with you. You know, in this reading tonight that we had, it seems like God's instructions to Samuel are quite specific. And I wondered, how did that happen? Do you hear God's voice speaking to you with instructions that are this specific? I mean, it's, you, can, you can see the little quotation marks around. This is what God's saying in word for word. And it's almost like the, you know, in the drawings where you have the balloons of the conversation or whatever. But this is what God says. And, um, you know, for us, how do we hear the voice of God? How do we hear God guiding us? Uh, Samuel heard God speak and give him these specific instructions this is the time for us as a congregation to be listening to God's voice. There are changes happening in the world, in Cumberland, in the way that we're working. How do we hear God's voice and God's instruction? That's one of the questions I come to with these texts. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul? And it's not that Saul is dead. Saul was the first king of Israel. And there were a lot of hopes that were placed on Saul. Um, all the people of Israel, as they returned from Egypt and as they were settling, you know, they had all this period with the judges. They said, we want to be like those people over there who have a king. We want to be like them. We want a king, and that's, that sounds like a really good thing. Look at all that the king is doing, and he protects them and provides for them, and they have their armies, and they go off to war, and they do stuff, and we want to be like that. We want a king like those other countries have. And God, you know, when God was leading with the judges, was saying, well, you don't need a king. Let's be a nation that follows after God and listens to God's voice. But for them, it was kind of nebulous. And, you know, who are we, how are we doing this? And they wanted a king. They wanted to be like everybody else. And so God agreed, gave in to what they wanted to do and um, anointed Saul. And Saul was a big, tall man who stood towering above all the other people. So when they saw him, they said, oh, let's have this guy for our king. And God chose him, and he was, um, at the beginning, it sounds like he was kind of shy. He wasn't looking for limelight. But he became king, and then uh, he stopped listening to God, stopped seeking after God, and God rejected him. The spirit of the God left him, and he didn't, he didn't seek after that. In fact, he became jealous 
as the king of other people and he was seeking things for himself instead. We have the stories um, of David who, who in contrast to Saul had the spirit of God on him. So David comes into the, our stories in the Old Testament. It seems like he has several entrances and different doors from different places, um, but it's this same David. And so one of them is tonight in the reading that we have um, where Samuel is sent to anoint this person to be the next king. In this story, there's fear. Samuel is afraid. He's afraid. He's sent on his journey, and he says, if Saul, Saul finds out what I'm doing, I'm going to be killed. He'll kill me. And Samuel was afraid, and he was involved in, in politics that the king didn't like. The townspeople were afraid. When Samuel, this prophet of God, arrived at their town, they trembled in fear. I can't remember when I arrived at a town and people trembled at my presence. Um, it doesn't happen today. But there was something about the recognition of Samuel that the presence of God is with this one. And the people were, were, had this awe and reverence of God and, and, and were trembling in fear because here God was coming to their, you know, through, through Samuel, was coming to their town. They ask, are you coming peaceably? <laughs> is God coming peaceably to us? What is this arrival that's bringing you, the prophet of God, to our village? And there is this respect and awe for the prophet, a fear of trembling because he represents God. That's been lost in our world, partly because of the abuses of the prophets, the false prophets and, and, and pastors and preachers, and, and also because the, the land doesn't have, you know, the world doesn't look at God in the same light. Um, that's a huge brush that I just used to strike the, you know, paint the earth because the earth, there's a whole spectrum in there. But I think that in, in many ways, the earth has, the people of the earth have left their fear of God or belief in God. So Samuel arrives in this little tiny place called Bethlehem and he uh, meets with Jesse and has Jesse call his sons. This story is uh, quite a story because, you know, this wonderful, strong, handsome, very, um, a winner <laughs> comes out, this oldest son of Jesse, and comes and Samuel says, oh my goodness, surely this is the one that God has chosen for us. And God says, I look at the heart. I don't look at the outward appearances. For our elections in our country, I wish we could know the heart of the candidate and have candidates whose heart is a heart after God. And human beings can't see the heart and sometimes we go after things that are skin deep. And so there is this need to listen to the voice of God in this. And Samuel, who thinks that, oh, this must be the way, God says no, and he's attentive to that and hears that. I think there have been many times in history that people have just taken their own path and said, oh, this is what we need to do. This is the right way. Um, it seems good. It looks good. But there is this listening to God, and in this process, God is saying, no, this isn't the way. Even though it looks good, and even though it seems like, oh, this would be perfect, God says, listen. And so seven of these brothers go by. In each one, God says, no, this isn't the one. And Samuel says, well, aren't there, aren't there any others? Do, I mean, are these all the sons you have? Said, well, there's the youngest one. <laughs> but he's out in the field. He's taking care of sheep. And Samuel calls him, says, have him come. And the, the role of the kings in Israel is the role of a shepherd taking care of the sheep. And that's something that is often equated as the, the leader caring for the people is the sheep who care, uh, the shepherd who takes care of the sheep. And so David has this symbolism in his identity that he is chosen from among uh, shepherding the sheep to shepherd the people of God. The shepherd in Spanish, the word for shepherd is pastor, spelled P-A-S-T-O-R. 
shepherd. And pastors are supposed to be shepherds. And we all are in this community together. Um, and we are called to, you know, like Jesus said to Peter, feed my sheep. We're called to feed and care for each other. So David is anointed. And David is anointed as God's chosen one to be the next king. Saul meets David through circumstances where their nation of Israel and the enemy nation were at a stalemate. This enemy nation had come up to fight Israel and they had this giant, Goliath, who was taunting the nation of Israel. And he'd get out there every day and said, send your best man and I'll fight him. I'll fight him, and whoever wins that battle, then the, uh, the rest of you have to serve that person's country. And the Israelites just trembled, and they couldn't do anything. They couldn't, they couldn't go on, and they were kind of held, and held hostage by this. David, who was a shepherd boy at home while his big brothers were off at war, um, Samuel wanted to find out about his brothers and sent him to check up on his brothers. Has your parents ever sent you to check up on your siblings or have you been the one checked up on? Or have you sent one child to check up on the other ones? So David was sent by his father to check up on his brothers and see how they were doing in this time of war. And he found out that they were with this group of people trembling at this giant and David, who's a boy, said, well, I'll go fight him. And no one else wanted to. So King Saul, this big man, puts his armor on David. And his armor is so big that David can't walk. He can't hold his armor on. And so he takes it off. And he goes out to battle without any kind of armor on. And he goes out with a slingshot and five stones that he picks out of a river. And Goliath is insulted. Do you come to me as if I'm a dog with stones to throw at me? And David says, I don't come to you with my own power, but I come in the power of God and God's gonna deliver you into my hands today. And he puts his stone in his sling and slings it around, hits the giant in the head with the stone and then goes over and maybe with both hands, pulls out the sword of the giant and chops off his head and takes it back to Saul. And all the nation is rejoicing about this, except that they start singing this song King Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. And Saul becomes jealous of David. And instead of trusting God and turning to God, Saul seeks to kill David. And he turns inward in his attempts to be his own king and to follow things in his way. And that's why David needs to be raised up someone else. David as king didn't do everything perfectly. He made some horrible, bad decisions that hurt the nation. With Bathsheba, when all, in the spring of the year, when all the kings go up to war, he stayed home and sent all the everyone else to war and he stayed home to enjoy his palace. And looking from his palace, he saw one of the soldier's wives, and the soldier was faithful off at war. He saw this soldier's wife and decided he wanted her and had relations with her, and she became pregnant. And then David ended up killing her husband in order to cover over his own sin as if he could hide that. And the gods told him that the sword will not depart from your house. Because you have brought the sword into your house, the sword will always be there. And David's children ended up in civil war against David. In the pain of the stories in the Old Testament of a family that's turned against each other with weapons and with war. And the nation hurt by that. Later, David wanted to, he was counting on his own power instead of trusting God. Um, I mentioned that I really liked going to a finance meeting for our congregation and hearing at our last finance meeting the finance team talking more about mission time-wise more minutes spent talking about mission than the money um, and I thought boy we got that in the right order we got that the way it should be David 
had a time when he decided he wanted to count on his own strength. How much money do I have in the bank? How many people do I have to do the work? And he went out and did a census of counting everyone. And God says, you're trusting in yourself and not in me. And so there's this epidemic and thousands and thousands and thousands of the Israelites died from the epidemic. The thing about David, though, that set him apart was that he had a heart after God. And we have in the Psalms these cries from, from David, cleanse me, forgive me. Don't cast your spirit away from me. Though my sins are many, wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. And we have these, these um, cries from David for forgiveness and constantly seeking God. And he's described at one with God's own heart. This text tonight has Samuel grieving. Samuel grieving over dreams that did not turn out the way they wanted. They wanted a king. There were things he hoped for, and the, th and the hopes didn't come true. The nation wasn't on the path that he wanted. The king wasn't what he'd hoped for when he anointed the king. And he was grieving, and in our lives, sometimes we have things that no longer fulfill. Saul started out well, but the story didn't go well after that. And we come to places in our lives where our dreams, our hopes, the way that we wanted things to work aren't happening that way anymore. We're holding on to those things, holding on to the, to the past and grieving and wishing, how could we make those things right? And God says, why are you grieving the things of the past? Let go of those things because I'm going to do something new and maybe in a new way and raise up new people. And so God chooses to send Saul and even though Saul is afraid for his life in doing this, he trusts God that God's word will be true. And I think we're called, you know, when we have so many things in this world that have changed and we have grieving the loss of, of what it was like in the past. God says, how long are you going to grieve for the things in the past? Because I have things I want to show you. And we'll raise up new ways and new people and new kings and new leaders. So we come this night. We bring our broken dreams, our disappointments, our hurts to God. We bring them to the font and what we receive from God is the promise of wholeness and blessing in days to come. And Luther called that the happy exchange. We come to God listening. What is it that God is choosing? Listening to the voice. What is God telling us to do? And seeking to know what God chooses because God looks at the heart. God sees the big picture. God sees what lies ahead. God sees the things we can't see. And so we trust God instead of our own vision. We let go of the things that are hard to let go of. And we open our hearts up to the day that comes that is new. May God's peace be with you. O oh Lord, our God, changes come in this world, changes come in our lives. And we have your promises that come new each morning. As we come to new seasons in our lives, new stages in our lives, you are already there before us as individuals and as communities. And you go and you prepare the way before us. and where we have pain and broken dreams and disappointments from the past. We grieve these things, but there comes a time when you say, are you ready to move on? Because I have things for you to show you, new things to do for you. Oh Lord, this night we bring to you our hurts, our disappointments, good things from the past that are no more. 
we bring these things and commend them to you. Lord, in your mercy. Oh, Lord, we thank you that tomorrow is a new day, new opportunities, new calls, new experiences, new energy, new youth, even from unexpected places. We ask that you would guide us, our congregation, our lives, our homes, our families, that we might listen to you and faithfully follow where you follow. Doesn't mean everything will be easy. David made decisions that were hurtful to others, and yet his reign was the time of glory for the kingdom, the time when the kingdom of Israel was able to settle and develop and establish and be blessed and grow because he listened and followed after you. So we pray, O oh Lord, that even though we encounter things that are difficult at times, even though we have decisions that we make that are sometimes hurtful, we pray that we might be willing to listen to you, to turn to you, to seek forgiveness, to be molded by you, to follow you. May we come to recognize your voice, to hear and to be obedient. Lord, in your mercy. Oh Lord, this night we want to bring before you those who are dear to us. We have answers to prayer, thanksgiving for David who had good word from his doctor about things he doesn't need to worry about. We thank you for that. We thank you, oh Lord, for Therese and her friend who have come through their studies, that you've brought them through these things. Oh Lord, we thank you for the gifts and the journeys you've brought us on to and how you've provided for us in the past. We look to you to provide for days to come. For Therese and her friend who are about to take their architecture exams. Oh Lord, may they be blessed in all that they have learned. May they be creative. May they use the gifts you gave them in this exam. Crown their efforts, O oh Lord, with your glory, your beauty, your blessings for them. And open to them your kingdom, your future for them. Lord, in your mercy. For David, O oh Lord, who is looking for a job that is stable, for something that can be dependable, we ask that you would provide for him his daily bread. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, we think of Diane's daughter-in-law who is at this time in labor. How you are bringing new things in new ways, new joys, new, um, new, um, new life, new possibilities. And we pray that you would be with them in that room, that you would protect the birth, the new process, the life, that you would protect family, mother, child, and that your blessings would be upon this one that as you anointed David, to be a blessing to the earth, that you would bless this little baby who's being born to be a blessing. She would anoint this child as your own to be a blessing for her, for the family and for this world. Lord, in your mercy. Oh Lord, for Sherry's sister Vicki, who is going through these serious health conditions and who is in surgery today, we thank you for bringing her through surgery. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would protect her, surround her with your angels and your mercy. Raise her up to strength and give wisdom and guidance to her care providers. Give her courage and strength and her family. Give them your peace, O oh Lord, this night. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, for Jerry's niece, for Sharon Meyer, who is in the hospital at WVU with serious illness and now her 31-year-old has been diagnosed with brain tumor, mother of a one-year-old and three-year-old. How much can a family bear? These things seem overwhelming, and so we look to you, O Lord, for these things that are so big. But we thank them, you that they are not outside of your abilities or power, that you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond all we can ask or imagine. So we bring them to you, the great physician, 
asking for your mercy and your healing, for your strength and your health for Jerry's family. Lord, in your mercy. And hear now, O Lord, the prayers that we offer to you silently or loud. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, we are yours. Our future is yours. You have lives to anoint. You have blessings to reveal. You call us to changes that will bring good to us. And we wait and eagerly listen and look for you. We love you, Lord. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Let's gather around the banquet table. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. It's shed for you, given for you, and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. The blood of Christ shed for you for new beginnings. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
And now may the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. <coughs> We have an amazing God, creator of the universe, who talks to us and calls us and gives us new opportunities. We have an amazing God. We can face giants not by our own strength and might, but by the Spirit of God. We have a God who calls us to things that we can't even imagine. May God, the giver of love, Christ, the resurrection, the life, and the Holy Spirit of rebirth bless you in this Lenten journey. Amen. Our hymn is, If You But Trust in God to Guide You, 769. to God.